Well, it seems Jeffrey Epstein has gone and snapped his own neck. And if you believe that, I have some Venezuelan cryptocurrency I'd like to talk with you about investing in. This next article comes by way of American Thinker. It's written by Daniel John Sobieski. I hope you enjoy. Now, Jeffrey Epstein's death is officially a suicide, but something still smells fishy, as Dr. Mark Siegel noted on Fox News recently. Based on the evidence and autopsy, he doesn't rule out foul play. It could be a suicide that was allowed to happen, or even encouraged, what with guards falling asleep, guard logs being falsified, and cellmates being removed, as BuzzPack Review reports. A Fox News medical correspondent believes the latest autopsy reports on Jeffrey Epstein increase the chances that his death was a murder rather than a suicide. Dr. Mark Siegel, in an interview with Fox Business Network, discussed the developing report on the death of the 66-year-old billionaire and convicted sexual offender who died by apparent suicide last week at the federal prison in New York where he was being held without bond while awaiting trial on sex trafficking charges. In his case, the autopsy is now revealing that multiple bones were broken in his neck, including the hyoid, Siegel said Thursday. The hyoid bone might break in strangulation, about one-third of one-half of the time. In suicide and or hanging, it might break 6 to 10 percent of the time, depending on which study you're looking at. A much less percentage, he explained. Something in this situation really smells, Siegel replied, noting that the Metropolitan Correctional Center where Epstein was being held has not had a suicide in decades. He noted that while suicide is a problem in jails around the nation, especially among sexual predators, it was not an issue at the Manhattan lockup. Quote, I don't know what happened here, but I don't like the way it's being put together. There's too many convenient excuses, and there's too many people, as you say, looking the other way. The question to ask in crimes and suspicious deaths is always, who would benefit from this individual's death? It was mere coincidence, of course, that a day after a federal appeals court released formerly sealed records in a defamation suit linked to accused pedophile Jeffrey Epstein's madam, revealing names and a Bill Clinton party on Epstein's sexual fantasy island. Jeffrey Epstein, now on suicide watch after a previous attempt, is found dead of an apparent suicide in a secure facility that once safely housed Mexican drug lord El Chapo Guzman. As BuzzPack Review reports, on Friday, a federal appeals court released what has been described as the first batch of thousands of pages of sealed records linked to a defamation suit filed against convicted billionaire pedophile Jeffrey Epstein's madam. Contained within the nearly 2,000 pages of documents are allegations from Epstein's alleged sex slave, Virginia Roberts, regarding the powerful man who she'd been forced to have sex with, along with the powerful men whom she'd sometimes seen in Epstein's presence. One set of pages specifically contained a deposition from Virginia. Within the deposition, she describes being flown to the Caribbean when she was 17 years old and then tagged alongside the madam who took a big black helicopter to pick up Bill Clinton. Quote, Epstein did invite two young brunettes to a dinner which he gave on his Caribbean island for Mr. Clinton shortly after he left office, it read. Quote, I'd had been about 17 at the time. I flew to the Caribbean with Jeffrey, and then Maxwell, the madam, went to pick up Bill in a huge black helicopter that Jeffrey had bought her. Bill Clinton had a habit of ditching his Secret Service protection when flying with child predator Epstein on the Lolita Express. Fox News reported Friday that records show Mr. Clinton declined Secret Service protection on at least five flights. The network's investigation revealed Mr. Clinton flew on the Boeing 727 Lolita Express 26 times, more than doubling the previous reported 11 trips. Bill Clinton, associated with a man like Jeffrey Epstein, who everyone in New York, certainly within his inner circles, knew was a pedophile. Why would a former president associate with a man like that, said Conchita Sarnoff of the Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit alliance to rescue victims of trafficking. Miss Conchita also authored a book on it, Mr. Epstein, titled Traffic King. Mr. Epstein was arrested in 2005 and signed a plea agreement in 2017 with the U.S. Attorney's Office, accepting a single charge of soliciting prostitution. He agreed to a 30-month sentence, 
registering as a Tier 1 sex offender with the U.S. Virgin Islands, and paid off dozens of young girls under a federal statute providing for compensation to victims of child sexual abuse. A Clinton spokesperson did not return the network's emails requesting comment. Martin Weinberg, Mr. Epstein's attorney, declined multiple inquiries into the flights. It is not known how many times Bill Clinton had his seat and tray table in the upright and locked position when flying with Jeffrey Epstein, or whether their conversations revolved around golf and grandchildren. It is not known why Clinton flew so many times with a child sex predator. Given Bill Clinton's track record and Epstein's experience on, well, procurement, one would doubt that it was to solicit donations to the Clinton Foundation. Gilligan's Island this most certainly was not, and on these flights there was more amenities available than a beverage cart and bag of peanuts, as the Daily Caller notes. On one trip, Clinton also traveled with actor Kevin Spacey, go figure, who is now accused of having sex with an underage boy. Clinton traveled aboard the Lolita Express with a softcore porn actress and traveled on 11 flights with Epstein's assistant Sarah Kellen, who allegedly procured underage girls for men, according to Gawker. Gawker reports Kellum was accused in court filings of acting as a pimp for Epstein, recruiting and grooming young girls into their network of child sex workers, and of course frequently participating in sex acts with them. It is amazing that every time the Clintons face incarceration, someone who has incriminating evidence just seems to die. Before there was the Hillary Clinton email scandal, there was Whitewater, there was of course Travelgate, and there was the hiding of records from Vince Foster's office after his apparent suicide. William Sapphire described Hillary Clinton in a 1996 essay in the New York Times. Sapphire observed, again the line was not irrational. Investigators believe that damning records from the Rose Law Firm, wrongfully kept in Vince Foster's White House office, were spirited out of the dead of night and hidden from the law for two years. In Hillary's closet, in Webb Hubble's basement, before his felony conviction in the president's secretary's personal files. Why the White House concealment? For good reason. The records show Hillary Clinton was lying when she denied actively representing a criminal enterprise known as the Madison SNL, and indicates she may have conspired with Webb Hubble's father-in-law to make a sham land deal that cost taxpayers $3 million. There is a joke going around that former FBI Director James Comey decided not to prosecute Hillary Clinton because he found his suicide note in her files. And that certainly doesn't seem so funny anymore. The Clintons sure have left quite a trail of carcasses in their wake. Speaking of carcasses, funny thing, out of all the people involved in this disgusting elitist trafficking scandal, the most surprised in the fact that Jeffrey Epstein committed suicide was Jeffrey Epstein himself. And on that note, I'm going to call it a day. If you liked it, hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't, leave a comment down below. There's a PayPal link in the description box, so please put a dollar in the bucket on the way out the door. I want to thank everybody for all your donations. They're much needed and they're much appreciated. Now, with all that being said, we'll see you next time. Hi. Come on, move. Move. Easy, easy. Sex trafficking charges against Jeffrey Epstein are horrifying. But there's a part of the story that's mysterious and interesting and potentially significant legally and newsworthy. Jeffrey Epstein was famously rich. He was friends with the world's richest and most influential people. He had one of the most expensive homes in New York City, access to a private jet. He literally has his own private island. Everyone calls him billionaire Jeffrey Epstein. You'd think billionaire was his first name. All of a sudden, though, no one can answer the most obvious question. How much money did he have and how did he make it? What did Jeffrey Epstein do for a living? Nobody seems to know.
Well, we're confused. There's one person we go to just reflexively. <laughs> Melissa Francis, she co-hosts Outnumbered here at Fox News Channel. Also, after the bell on Fox Business, we're always happy to have her. Maybe you know the answer, Melissa Francis. So the same thing was driving me crazy that people kept saying billionaire hedge fund manager. And I'm like, what hedge fund? What are we exactly. talking about here? Where did this money come from? This has been the subject of a lot of mystery and curiosity for a while. You mentioned the property. We can verify and confirm that, yes, he does own at least six properties around the world, including that $80 million townhouse in New York and that private island. But where did the money to buy that come from? We've got to go back to the beginning. He was originally a math teacher at Dalton on the Upper East Side, which is a very snooty private school here in New York City. Uh, he had never graduated from college, but he was there teaching calculus and physics. He tutored the son of legendary Bear Stearns trader, Ace Greenberg. And when he was tutoring his son, Ace said, you're so good at math, you should come work on Wall Street. He at that point went down and became an options trader, which is very math based. After a few years, he left Bear Stearns. And according to the SEC, there were some questions about what happened at Bear Stearns and why he left. No more details than that, just some allegations. At that point, he hung out his own shingle and he partnered with a guy named Stephen Hoffenberg, who was convicted of running a $460 million Ponzi scheme. At the time that man was convicted, he said that Epstein was involved, but no charges were ever brought against him. Those allegations were never corroborated, but they did try and do about three takeovers together at around this time. After that, he then took his company offshore to that island, and all of a sudden he was set up in the Virgin Islands where you don't have to report anything. You don't have to say your clients are, you don't have to say how much money you have on record. Mm. And for that reason, Forbes would never put him on the list because they couldn't verify how much money he had. At that point, his only public client on record is a guy named Leslie Wexner, who is the CEO of the company that owns Victoria's Secret. And after that, he was always connected to Wexner and he said that he only managed money for billionaires. If you couldn't give him a billion dollars, he wasn't gonna do it. But no one has any idea who any of his other clients were and no one else has ever admitted, as far as we could tell and confirm, no one else has admitted to being a client of his. The strangest part is how that part of the story ends. He was given that townhouse from Wexner, it was deeded over to him, and no one can find a payment that he paid Wexner for it in any way. That is He the also has hand-me-down airplanes from Wexner that used to that airplane that you see him on, at least one of them. Melissa in, Francis, if, if, if I can just deputize you, our Jeffrey Epstein reporter, I hope you will come back on this amazing I'm gonna do subject. It. I'm going to stay Thank on you. it.